All right, welcome everyone and hello to all of our friends from around the globe. I'm Nikki Medina, Director of Education here at SIM and will serve as today's moderator. Welcome to Interact with the Interactive Multimedia IMR Reporting Gurus, brought to you by the HIMSS SIM Enterprise Imaging Community. This webinar is eligible for one hour of SIM IIP credits. These credits can be used for ABI SIP certification, as well as in your other category for the CP HIMSS certification. Please be sure to add your questions throughout the webinar, as we will take time at the end to answer as many as the time can allow. So today we have three phenomenal folks who have worked really hard with the HIMSIM Enterprise Imaging uh, work groups and community over the past couple of years. Um, please welcome uh, Dr. Seth Berkowitz. He is an interventional radiologist, clinical informaticist, and, ra and medical director of radiology informatics in the Department of Radiology at Beth Israel Deacon, Deaconess Medical Center, a teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Berkowitz is passionate about using software to facilitate communication between clinicians and between providers and patients. He has developed an interactive multimedia report viewer that has been integrated into several commercial packs. Also with us today is Dr. Les Folio. He is senior member of the Diagnostic Imaging and Interventional Radiology at Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute. He is also a professor in the Department of Oncological Services at the University of Florida College of Medicine. Dr. Folio pioneered interactive multimedia reporting in February 2015 and has published its first clinical use in a AJR in September of 2015, and in the, in the Radiology Journal in March of 2018. Dr. Folio is currently leading interactive reporting in enterprise imaging to include ocular and dental imaging advances. And last, but definitely not least, Mr. David Kwan is an informaticist and subject matter expert in the domain of diagnostic imaging and a leader in structured and synaptic reporting. David is principal consultant for Insignia Consulting, providing an advisory and consulting services to de for developing strategy, technology advancements, process change, and project planning. David is currently working with the International Standards Development Organization to develop interoperable reporting standards for image reporting. David is co-chaired the IMR Task Force Initiative that has led the development and publication of the IMR Technical Framework Supplement. All three have co-authored the collaborative papers on IMR for the HIMSS-SIM workgroup. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn sharing over to Dr. Folio. Welcome so much, Dr. Folio. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. All right. So uh, I'll talk about uh, interactive multimedia reporting, my experience with it as we uh, implemented it years ago, as uh, Nikki had mentioned, our published white papers and the IHE uh, profile success. Uh, that'll be discussed by uh, David and, and Seth uh, after me. I'll just give a few minutes of my history with this. These are my disclosures, patents, uh, boards, these kind of things. Uh, so I'll share interactive multimedia reporting that started with uh, radiology. Uh, that was uh, then quickly followed by um, imaging-centric medical specialties that we uh, actually uh, started to coin uh, that phrase in our white papers. Uh, to include dermatology, um, ophthalmology, cardiology, and endoscopy, and also with uh, dentals we're looking into now, and how the IMR workgroup uh, successfully published uh, two white papers, uh, which was uh, part of our aims. I'd like to go back in time a little bit after I retired from the military doing target lesions uh, in a different uh, way, but now uh, back in 2010, when I just after sh I shorted, uh, shortly started at uh, NIH, we were able to uh, click on a lung lesion and segment it, scrape across a liver lesion, uh, and this kind of automatic segmentation that a lot of uh, PACs are starting to do now. 
Uh, and what we did too at the time was since these had X, Y, Z locations and segmentations, we applied a mini CAD with our, our vendor Alvatec at the time and CareStream, which was uh, later acquired by Philips, where we wanted the ability to click one button and look at the follow-up exam in clinical trials, where if you look at these arrows, they're actually automatically segmenting the lesions uh, that were previously identified. And this is uh, done by several vendors now, but we created the ability to not only automatically segment them, uh, but to then uh, have the data in the background. And this was done with uh, registration, anatomic registration. Then uh, a couple of years later, uh, we published that in 2013. Then uh, the, ne the next year or so, we started uh, taking uh, our reports in clinical trials with these measurements that were buried in the reports that we wanted to stand out, not only as hyperlinks visually, uh, but to be able to have uh, the PIs on clinical trials be able to simply click on a on a link and take one to uh, the actual uh, images. So each link you click on, it would take you to that image, the annotation and X, Y location, and also Z axis. So from that point, you could scroll on. These aren't just key images. This was complete interactivity where every annotation was directly connected to the hyperlink with the text surrounding it. Keep that in mind. Then we had the, the ability to, uh, with that data in the background, have uh, it tabulated and graphed. Here you can see a patient uh, just started cancer treatment here, took away the uh, the size of the lesion somewhat, and then uh, they remain relatively unchanged after that, but they uh, were a partial responder. And you could see that at an instant. So uh, NIH radiologists have been doing that now for about eight years and continue to do that, which I'll show you. Uh, partially because it's so easy to do. Uh, uh, when I first uh, transferred, it was a little bit hard for me to get back into being able to dictate measurements and actually say them because I did not say them for the last six years when I was at NIH. We would just say hyperlink and the prior, the, the latest measurement that we made would just automatically uh, go into our report. You didn't have to say the measurement. You didn't have to cross check. It's, it's like magic. Then we created the ability to uh, hyperlink uh, from uh, our reports. So here, a lung nodule that we're curious about, we click on it. We radiologists would then look at the lung nodule, but then we created the ability to take the comparison exam uh, report and open that instantly without having to hunt for that. And since our uh, our reports were highly structured, about level five, uh, uh, not quite synoptic, but in the proper order. It's pretty much uh, compressing the entire body into a page from top down. Here's the lungs. You can see that the growth of this lesion about a tenth of a centimeter, which didn't take the patient off trial, but you watch it closely. You go into the bookmark table, which you can also click uh, anywhere. Click the lesion, take it to the report, click it, take it, go to the bookmark table, go and look at the prior uh, measurement and see who was also a target lesion, see who measured it, and all kinds of data, about 25 different uh, data points for each measurement. Then we looked at, uh, after we uh, created the ability, I believe first in the in the world, uh, there might have been others uh, starting to experiment too around uh, February 2015. So um, we had our bookmarks on the rise because we were getting ready for it, but this was the actual hyperlink start date. And once we created that ability uh, in CT, it took off. And now it's about 80% there at NIH and, and similar to other places I'll show you. PET CT uh, grew a little slower with a little jagged edge, but that depended on whether or not Mark was there, for example, uh, to teach the residents. And uh, those jagged edges became smoother. MR, uh, not as much, but uh, every time a measurement is made in MR, uh, they are making hyperlinks out of them too. And then uh, a year later, a little more uh, past a year, about uh, July, I think, is when UVA started this and Craig Askin and Beasley uh, published this nice work. So after they were really looking at after the training in September 2016, uh, you can see the mark rise in the ad adoption. And this to me is better than statistics. This is showing that radiologists use it, especially in PET CT, very handy. Uh, for that and CT, M MR a little bit less, and uh, even in plain films like tomosynthesis, these types of things. Then to address the interoperability challenges, we started the HIMSIM um, interactive reporting work group uh, from the HIMSIM community. Uh, you can see David, myself here, and Chris Roth, and then Seth took over for the final year uh, of uh, mentoring, uh, well, and taking the lead on, on the second publication. But as you can see, our aims were to establish this international group. We had about 80 participants, um, maybe about 10 or 20 on the publications. 
Uh, we published um, the white papers as we hoped to, um, a little bit better than we thought, because uh, uh, we also got the IHE profile, thanks to David and, and lots of efforts for, from everyone in this work group. And this will help develop consensus on standards, which uh, require quite a few standards like DICOM, TID 1500, annotation image markup, these types of things. First white paper published uh, and described the imaging centric clinical specialties with examples. I'll show you uh, two, maybe three examples here. Then the second paper uh, addressing the technical uh, developments that David will introduce and Seth will describe how uh, the details of that. Uh, so uh, this is an example in dermatology from uh, Veronica Rothenberg from Sloan Kettering. This is an interactive kind of version, as you see in the first white paper, where you have a avatar representing the person. Uh, actually, this would be a 3D photogram, uh, which is now possible on a phone, uh, where you can zoom around the body, look on the outside, say, look at this particular lesion. And in a report, uh, the uh, dermatologists could be able to uh, do an interactive report where you click on this eccentric sparing. What is she talking about? Uh, and then that shows the description uh, and then the, the benign uh, pathology uh, here is then described, which is um, very good for the uh, referring clinician to see what's going on and also to explain for the uh, to the patient. There's the reference for that first paper. We also had this and Monique Eid help with this particular one where you have a cardiology report, the cardiac catheterization, be able to click on the stenosis. Let's see where this uh, LAD 80% stenosis is. Click to the diagram, be able to click to uh, the CT uh, IR fluoroscopy, which is uh, possible uh, today. Then in pathology, Toby Corners and Anil uh, contributed this where uh, pathology has been doing synoptic reporting, very high structured level, the highest, if you will, similar to our BIRADs, LIRADs, these kind of things. But pathology has been doing this for 10 or 15 years in the synoptic um, world, but then making them interactive where you take the synoptic report, take the 7.5 centimeters, see exactly what he's talking about on the gross path, go into the histopathology uh, to different levels, always have a scale, being able to zoom. Uh, it's just uh, uh, like magic to be able to go through path reports like that. And in ophthalmology, we're looking into the 14 or so modalities ophthalmology has. Here's retinal uh, retinal images that even an optometrist is obtaining in, in the um, commercial world or on the, like uh, front lines, if you will. But then getting to the ophthalmologist when this glaucoma gets worse and the ophthalmologist says, well, the cup to disc ratio is increasing. The pressures are increasing. You could become blind with this. And then you can compare and interact and click. Similar to fluorescein dye, or in this case, the optical coherence tomography, another ophthalmology modality, hard to understand. But when you have this and you say, okay, here's the red streaks, here's the vascular compromise that's starting to happen. Then here are the visual fields. Everywhere there's a dark triangle, the patient is essentially going blind in this eye. Uh, so you can see uh, this and uh, potentially interact uh, quicker with uh, treatment. So in sum, uh, I talked about the interactive multimedia reporting. Uh, what I'm showing here would be a home run in machine learning where these are directly interconnected. And imagine then reversing after the scan is sensing and doing workless triage, the machine learning is then automatically annotating these lesions, measuring them, and because of where they are, then producing the report in reverse. So this is the future. This is a... Uh, um, currently possible in, in experimental world, world, but uh, this is the world I would like to see in a couple of years where uh, the report is starting to be generated more for me. About 60% of the report is generated, but imagine now reversing that, coming up with that, and then I would simply then review everything, agree with the measurements, and then sign off on the report. So that's what I consider a grand slam, really. So in sum, I talked about interactive multimedia reporting, how we started it at uh, NIH, and then followed by Craig Askin at, um, at University of Virginia, showing the adoption, uh, how it can improve reporting for referring clinicians, and also how this is expanding out to all imaging-centric specialties, which is most every medical specialty I can think of from the patient themselves taking a picture of, of, of themselves or, their, or of their family. And the two uh, white papers that we'll make uh, available here as links for you. Uh, and now I'll turn it back to uh, Nikki, or do you, do you want to, or do we go direct to Seth now? Let's go ahead and go direct to Seth. And as we're oh, doing sorry. that, David has some comments. 
We can't hear you, David. Sorry, I hit the wrong mute button. Apologies. I'm going to supply a little bit of narrative uh, to bridge from Les to um, Seth, a little bit of background. Uh, on the first white paper, um, it was mainly concentrating on what are the clinical uses of IMR. And it was amazing the amount of passion that all these imaging specialists and, and, and informaticists brought to the table in that uh, we had a, a huge 70 page uh, white paper to go with. We had originally wanted to also speak about technical gaps and some of the, the challenges that we had in, in imp actually implementing IMR across several of these imaging uh, focused specialties. But in the end, we decided to spin that off and just concentrate on more of the clinical side. So out of, <laughs> with so much passion, uh, same thing happened on the technical consideration side. Again, we had something like close to 60 pages and we had to really kind of narrow that down. We had a lot of, a lot of passion from ophthalmology as well as dermatology, uh, but we did, we didn't delve into that. What we decided to do was focus on what are the technical, what is the technical landscape in IMR? Uh, a lot of it is in, in, in radiology, mainly because IMR is being deployed or is deployed and being operational uh, in radiology and diagnostic imaging. And we wanted to identify what are those real challenges in terms of interoperability and implementing IMR. At the same time, we also wanted to give value uh, to the audience uh, in, in, in a domain that is starting to really uh, take off and that is digital pathology. So we did have Toby and Il and, and, and Douglas help us in, in, in penning a lot of the technical considerations. So it's not to say this is a radiology uh, um, paper or initiative. It's really laying the technical framework um, that will allow other uh, imagers to, 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 to deploy IMR. And we landed on uh, integrating healthcare enterprise IEG, mainly because IEG, when we do develop a technical profile, we leverage standards. We don't create standards. What we do is we write profiles that leverages existing standards or, or, or emerging standards. And we also identify uh, where the gaps are in those standards and with, with a lens that we're looking at specific use cases. So it's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of value for solution developers, implementers uh, in, in an IHE profile. And with that, I'm gonna turn over to, to Seth to talk about some of those uh, considerations and some of the work that has been going on. So Dr. Berkowitz, take it away, please. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you, Les. Um, you know, Les has really been the, the visionary that's that's driven all this work. And David, you've been really the, the driver that has kind of kept us focused um, on, on moving forward and, and bringing IMR um, to a larger number of people. So um, I'm going to focus on um, some of the technical aspects of, of putting an IMR together. Um, I have a few disclosures unrelated to this presentation. Um, and my hope is, you know, these were the questions that um, all of you answered when uh, enrolling in this webinar. Um, now I see 26, uh, almost probably a little less than half are satisfied with your current reports. I hope that after seeing Les's presentation, you've changed your mind um, and realized there's a lot more that can be done in reporting uh, because we see only a very small number of people are actually using interactive multimedia reporting. And so, Every time I hear Les talk, and every time I look at those numbers, I constantly am asking myself, why isn't everyone doing this? Right? To me, hearing Les's talk is, this is the coolest thing in the world. And every single radiology report uh, across the world should really be created in such a fashion that what the radiologist or what that image-centric specialist is describing is discreetly linked to those images that created that finding. And so this is really what motivated our work um, in creating this technical white paper, where we tried to dive into the technical details to realize what were the barriers and what are the ongoing barriers um, stopping image-centric specialists from using IMR? And how can we as a standards community um, put the standards together um, to make this more universal? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So 
at a high level, this is what, what Les talked about, but kind of just thinking conceptually about what an IMR is. You have these content contributors, which are either the physician, the image centric specialist, um, perhaps you have an AI system as Les alluded to, perhaps you have modalities. And all these are putting data into a report. Um, and through context sharing between a report creator and an image display system, you can generate these hyperlinks in the report. And then the value of those hyperlinks are that when we're trying to convey the meaning of our reports to our consumers, so those may be other image centric specialists, so other radiologists, other pathologists, maybe primary care doctors, oncologists, surgeons, or patients, the context of what we are interpreting is very clear because there's this discrete hyperlink between the findings and the image. So when we think about how reports are created, I like to use this conceptual diagram of a reporting workflow. So we have an image display system, and then there's a specialist, an image centric specialist who authors the report using some report authoring tool. And then that report needs to go to an EHR, ultimately where that report is viewed. And that report's gonna get viewed by a referring clinician who often wants to refer back to the images um, in some image display system that may be a enterprise viewer or, or a PAC system. And the problem is, is that for most of us, there are barriers at all of these levels. Um, so much of the great work that Les was able to achieve at NIH is because the image display system and the report authoring tool were linked together. They were one piece of software. Um, but when we think about the majority of, of users is that we're often using different systems and there are barriers in between communication between the image display system and the report authoring tool. Uh, there are also barriers that even if you can create an IMR, most EHRs are unable to accept this rich um, formatted document. And even if your EHR can display a rich formatted document, there are no standards for displaying a link um, to that image in context. So what we tried to do with this work is address all of these barriers, and we'll go through these one by one. So first I'm gonna talk about the barriers in the report authoring stage. So when we think about report authoring conceptually, um, what the author does is they look at the images, then they manipulate or process the images. They may um, create annotations or so arrow, arrows, circular regions of interest. They may make quantitative measurements um, like linear measurements, Hounsfeld units, um, segmentations. Um, the, the, we'll say radiologist in this, in this sense, but the image centric specialist is gonna compare across historical exams. And then what that specialist does is they create a report that really puts the meaning and the diagnosis to the imaging findings. So they may use a voice recognition system, they may use a laboratory information system, perhaps a dermatologist is dictating a note directly um, into the EHR. Um, but this is, is at a high level what the process is. And um, they basically conjure up this report um, using a variety of sources. So they create the text through dictation or typing. They have source images um, that would go into a multimedia report. Um, they make annotations. So again, these, these measurements are made and um, what many of us do are we're dictating those measurements, but what we'd really like is those annotations themselves to go directly into the multimedia report. And as Les pointed out, as artificial intelligence becomes a larger portion of our workflow, we want that directly to Im import into our reports. And so one of the things we created in our paper is we created this concept. We, we stole, um, stole the idea of levels of maturity. And so we said, you know, for in order to even think about creating an IMR, there needs to be a basic level of images that go into the system. And so if you're not doing digital imaging, all bets are off. If it's a proprietary digital imaging platform, again, we can't really do much with that. Um, especially in other specialties, things like uh, ophthalmology, a lot of images are stored in image only formats without patient exam metadata, things like JPEG or MP4. Not much we can do about that. But if we have a bare set of standards where our systems are using DICOM web, um, then we can start to think about using standards to create an IMR. Similarly, um, for annotations, if the annotations are burned into the pixels, if they're in a proprietary format, there's not much we can do about that. And so what we said is at a bare minimum for interactive multimedia reporting, 
we need interoperable non-destructive pixel annotations. However, there's even more that we can do. Um, so if we have um, annotations that have semantic meaning, such as DICOM SR, um, or if we have annotations that link um, to a patient pathology or organ beyond that single exam, um, there's so much more we can do with IMR. Um, but at a basic level, we need non-destructive uh, interoperable pixel annotations, things like DICOM SR and GSPS. So thinking a little bit about our workflow, again, um, for many of us who aren't using um, singular image display and report authoring tools, um, the radiologist or that's image centric specialist is, is dealing in two silos. So they create measurements and annotations. And then at the same time, they dictate measurements and imaging features in their report. But these two things really describe the same data without linkage. And they may talk about key images and dictate image references, uh, but there's no linkage. But we think at a technical level, there really are ways of linking these things. So for example, DICOM presentation states, which are used in most clinical PAC systems um, for measurements and annotations, um, and DICOM SR, which have measurements and semantics. And for key images, there's DICOM UIDs um, and key image uh, object selection objects that are the technical pieces and the standards that, that help describe these things. And so one of the challenges we have is how do we communicate these linkages between the report um, and the image display system? And so there is a peer-to-peer -peer model in which a display system can communicate directly with a report creator. And a lot of the systems that already exist um, are using such a model. And this is obviously a lot easier if the image display system and the report creator are created by the same vendor and are, are part of the same package. However, what we envision is a system where it won't matter what image display system you're using or what report creator you're using, um, but we should have a, a, a standards um, for these two to communicate. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the IAT profile being drafted actually as we speak, in which we're thinking about using a context sharing mediator in which an image display system can basically send out a message to say a measurement has been drawn on that image. And then a report creator can subscribe to that measurement, or subscribe to that message, sorry, to know that a measurement was drawn on an image and immediately import that um, image reference and the measurement into the report. And the future is even more exciting because once we have this standards-based context sharing mediator, we can have decision support systems that are listening in real time and can understand immediately when I draw an arrow or draw a measurement on the lung nodule, they can immediately know that that's a lung nodule. And perhaps these decision support systems can feed back to my report creator with a lung rad score or other, other information to help uh, the, the physician um, come to the correct diagnosis and make the correct recommendations. So once we have our report created, and again, the, the future is, is, is even more exciting for how these reports will be generated, um, we still need to send them to an EHR. And this has been one of the barriers um, for some of the, the visionaries is that um, once you send one of these rich reports to an EHR, can the EHR display it? And does the EHR know how to interpret that link appropriately so it can jump back to the image that's mentioned? And I, I really like this model. Um, any, any communication, we need a communication channel. Um, and what, what we're using right now is, is really kind of a game of telephone um, using tin cans. And yes, there is an amazing amount that you can do with HL7 V2, which is what the majority of hospitals run on. Um, but in many ways, it's severely limited. Um, so you can base 64 encode a PDF into an HL7 message, um, but there's a, a, a minimum amount of richness that you can put. Um, and there's a lot that can be done with DICOM SR, for example, but unfortunately DICOM SR isn't uh, a predominant uh, messaging format uh, between report creators and EHRs. Um, and so what we did um, when the IHE was formulating a profile, uh, well, actually, sorry, even, even before that, in our, in our paper, we kind of looked at um, a whole bunch of different ways in which you could present uh, an interactive multimedia report. And so we looked at something like PDF and, and PDF is, is great. And um, you can put a lot of rich formatting images um, into PDF, 
Um, but in reality, there is, there is no structure in a PDF and you have just a fixed rendering. Um, HTML offers a ton of additional value in terms of being it responsive um, and the ability to start to put structure into the document. And what we ended up uh, really settling on is looking at, at fire and fire composition, um, as well as uh, fire um, imaging, uh, sorry, imaging report um, as a format and in order to be able to put together formatting, images, responsiveness, interactivity, uh, programmability and structure into uh, a single presentation format. And just conceptually, when we think about the ideal uh, format for an interactive multimedia report, I like to think about three different pillars, uh, so to speak. So there's formatting. You want your report to look pretty. You don't want it to just be plain text. You want formatted text with images. Um, but again, even though PDF can do that, PDF doesn't give us structure. And so we really want, um, we want beyond a plain text structure that facilitates parsing. We want structured reports in which the observations are coded using standardized ontologies. Because it's, it's only of limited value if we put all this hard work into structuring these measurements, if then you need NLP um, to parse them out again. And again, for interactivity, right now we're, you know, at a bare level, we're hoping for hyperlinks to external resources. Um, and then as Les showed, contextual hyperlinks back to an image viewing system. And we imagine even in the future, interactive widgets um, within the report body uh, to be able to show even more dynamic content. So again, how are we gonna get from here to there? So um, the, uh, the IHE profile for interactive multimedia reporting settled on the fire diagnostic report. Um, as the container for a report. Um, and so the idea is instead of being just text embedded in an HL7 V2 um, message, the radiology report is now encoded as a fire resource. And I'm not gonna spend today going deep into fire, um, but at a, at a high level, the benefit of using fire is that you can Im then embed other resources into the report. Um, and you can also embed XHTML, which is a, a, a sub, uh, a subset of HTML into the actual report text. And so you can do things like having this string um, where it looks like a normal report string, um, but then we can embed, sorry about that, we can embed a, a, a class in here, um, which is actually a hyperlink to an imaging selection object. And that imaging selection object is a, is a fire resource that can then encode a study, series, image instance UID, a frame, and this imaging selection object can even encode a segmentation, a structured report, a presentation state, or a region of interest. And what this does is it provides a common language for us to really start building um, amazing reports that link what's going on in the images with the text um, that is added by the radiologist or the image-centric specialist. So we've talked about some of the barriers and some of the some of the standards we can use to go between the imaging display system and the report authoring tool, and then how to send a standards compliant report using a fire um, diagnostic report to an EHR. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we can build those standards linkages to go back from the EHR to an image display system. And so again, the the, uh, the IHE profile that we worked on um, created um, some standards for describing image context links. And what we ultimately wanna do is not just link back to the image. Uh, this is kind of where most of us exist right now is we may have a link in our report that opens up that exam in our zero footprint viewer. But what we really need is we need, a, uh, we need images that can launch directly in context. So for example, if you have a, uh, a series and image reference in a CT, that's gonna launch directly in context of the scrollable images. If you're looking at a report that describes a whole slide image and some histology, um, you want a zoomed uh, histology image presented as a zoomed field of view uh, within that whole slide image viewer. And, um, you know, we also want this to scale gracefully uh, between different launching environments. So for example, in EHR, uh, we'd want a, that to launch a dedicated zero footprint viewer, for example. However, if an image-centric specialist, for example, a radiologist was reading this report natively in their PAC system, 
We wouldn't want that hyperlink to actually bring up that image reference directly in the PAC system. So then the radiologist could cross-reference and link the historical images as they're used, used to doing. So hopefully what I've shown is um, how we can overcome so, some of these barriers. So again, as, as a review of some of the standards that are developing and are being developed. Um, so the IAT profile for interactive multimedia reporting um, has already been released, was released this summer for trial implementation. And again, that breaks down this barrier because it gives us a container um, using the HL7 fire diagnostic report that we can transmit a rich interactive multimedia report from a report authoring tool to an EHR. And we've also, uh, through the uh, rendered report reader function um, and role within that profile, um, created a mechanism for a link in an EHR to open up an image um, in context within an image display system. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the work um, in progress. So, sorry, jumping ahead. So I think these links are going to be either in the chat or in uh, the email afterwards, but I really encourage everyone to go look at the profile. Again, this is released. Um, it's been released for trial implementation, just acknowledging that um, FHIR is undergoing a lot of changes. And in fact, we, we, we anticipate changes that are going to make this profile uh, even better. Um, but it's certainly out there to use um, and to start building um, you know, trial products against. Um, unfortunately, in order to actually create this report, we're still stuck with this barrier. Um, but this is where the current work of the IIT Radiology Technical Committee comes in. Uh, so we just had a meeting last week, and there is a lot of exciting progress in the um, real-time bidirectional communication for IMR um, group. So we anticipate that uh, this profile will be coming out um, probably uh, middle of next year. And so I, we really encourage everyone to be a part of this process, pay attention um, as this gets drafted, uh, submit public comments, because this is really going to complete um, the circle of reporting. Um, to allow us to generate um, and view interactive multimedia reports in a standards-based vendor neutral fashion. So um, returning back to that question that I posed, um, how do we get there from here, right? How do we get to, uh, to interactive multimedia reports? You know, this is one we're building internally based on, on open source frameworks. Um, how do we get there so that anyone can do this, regardless of what institution and what tool set they're using? Um, and that's based on standards. So um, I encourage, I've been really proud to be a part of the process so far, um, but I really encourage everyone uh, watching today to be a part of the process. So please advocate for, and if you're a vendor, develop products that implement the IHE IME, IMR profile for trial implementation. Um, participate in the development of the real-time bidirectional communication profile that's happening now. Uh, read our white papers. Um, I'm sorry if they put you to sleep, but please read them. Um, and again, if you're a user, um, push for this. If you're going through an RFP, um, push and ask your vendors, do they support IMR? And if you're a vendor, um, users are asking for this. So build, um, not only build interactive multimedia reports, uh, but build products that conform to the IAG profiles. So thank you very much for your attention today. Um, hopefully uh, everyone is, is just as excited about interactive multimedia reporting as we are. And I think we'll, we'll have a chance for some questions. Such great information. And you were getting uh, some really nice comments there between the chat and the, and the, the Q and A and how valuable this is, not just for today, but in the future. So great job. All right, so let's go ahead and move along to some of our questions. Um, we have a few that have come in through the Q&A box, so we can start there. Please feel free to continue to add questions as we go through the next few minutes. All right, so first question, Les. Um, where do you store images for these IMR in EMR packs and VNA? Also, are they only key images or a full study? And this is thank you to uh, Ravi. Yeah, and I'm glad uh, you gave me this question because the, the questions get harder uh, as we go along. 
I look at this question in two, maybe two and a half parts. I've started to type it out, but I'm, let me see if I did it justice. Um, that the images, uh, from my experience at NIH for the years that we did it, uh, they're still doing it. The images go to PACS. They're, they're in PACS. Uh, that I mean, they're they're stored in PACS as the viewer. It's also in a, a VNA. Uh, so that's a great question. They also go to a disaster recovery facility, depending on uh, your your workflow. So uh, the PACS is essentially the same. Now there's the risks, and then there's the annotations, and those can be stored in a number of ways. I've seen them stored as GSPS or other kinds of presentation states. The uh, beauty of the IMR is they reside within the PACS and they're within, in the XY locations and lob files that uh, may be proprietary depending on the flavors of DICOM of the vendor. Uh, I've seen a variety of those types of things. That's that's a great uh, question. If more have more experience on that, let me know. The EMR doesn't actually need to store any images and uh, uh, although they can, and there's a combination of that, but in my experience, uh, uh, the uh, the EMR can have links uh, that go out to the uh, a thin client, uh, not a PAX, but a but a viewer, uh, kind of a thin PAX, if you will. Uh, so that's it's not pulling up a full client. And uh, the second part of that question: Are they only the key images? And um, and that's a great question. No, they are not just the key images. You can make key images, and I always like to make them. Um, and that's sometimes all all some vendors have. Uh, but uh, they the images are are stored along in apparently in the image. More can go into more detail with that. But they are within the packs. They're also in a bookmark table. Again, saved um, uh, the the interactive component of those. They're going right to that location, so it's an exportable uh, file. Uh, there is a lob file or or otherwise or an annotation image markup. Uh, so I think uh, and it it those links would do take you to the 3D data data uh, and CT, MR, or, or uh, any even like a Cine uh, within the fluoroscopy I showed with a, a cardiovascular um, angiogram, for example. You take the Cine, make a mark somewhere within the Cine, it jumps you right to that frame of the Cine. Uh, so it's not just key images, it's taking you to the full study and then you can pan uh, from that part. Hopefully uh, that answered those questions. Uh, there's a couple here from Don. Have, uh, David had one quick, uh, yeah. David has his hand raised. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add to, to Les's. Um, so there's a couple of, of, of considerations we had when we were creating the profile. One is if you have a, a, an older study and your workflow and your implementation is you're going to move that to a VNA and off the packs. Uh, we did not figure that one out yet because the, the image reference is what's created at that time. So that is something that we're looking for, for input from solution developers as we evolve the profile. The other thing is the profile also wanted to ensure we did launch the entire study, which means that you know you, you can you just don't have a key image, you, you have the whole image, you can you can scroll through it. And the and, and, and the vehicle we use to do that is is fire image selection. And that's one of the reasons why there was, Seth pointed to, there's a big yellow warning on the profile that this is, is for trial use. Image selection is really uh, very early and it, it, it evolves. But the, the advantage of, of us using that fire resources, it has the entire profile for us to do multiple things in, in, in working with images. So uh, the toolkit that comes along with image selection is huge. We did not have to create any other uh, resources or standards to use in, 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 with that. So just a couple of uh, supplementary facts that, that we had. Uh, Seth, did you want to add anything? You look like you wanted to add something. Oh, I want to I want to take a stab at, at Don's question. Oh, OK. Cool. Go. Um, so some great feedback in the in the chat from Don Dennison and also from from uh, Tommy V, sorry about, um, I wouldn't try um, anything to butcher your last name. But uh, as far as why, why aren't we using PDF, right? I think a lot of people think about uh, IMR right now 
uh, as a as a PDF. And certainly, I think it is probably the standard of care. And there's a lot you can do. Um, base sixty four encoding a PDF into HL seven. A lot of EHRs can view this. And as Don pointed out in the chat, there are actually ways of um, kind of jerry rigging a PDF to um, to put in some sort of um, structured content. I think what we what we wanted to do, though, is to really build a platform that would allow us to dramatically change the radiology report and allow that radiology report to grow, um, to become even more structured over time, and to settle on kind of an existing standard for structuring clinical information. And so that's really where FIRE came in as you know, an emerging standard for how we can structure clinical content. And so by building the report on top of a, a fire object, we kind of are creating this fertile ground um, to really build the report of the future. Now, we didn't wanna to totally disregard the past and we also wanted to have a, you know, a kind of a clean transition. So, so the profile actually allows, and the fire diagnostic report actually allows you to embed a PDF into it. Um, and so for, you know, for vendors, you know, cause again, yes, most vendors right now are using PDFs. Um, those, those can and will be a part of IMR for the foreseeable future. Um, but our, our vision was that we could take these PDFs and kind of put them into a richer container, um, that allows us to, to encode, um, you know, that, that structure. David, I don't know if you have any more more thoughts on that. And, no, no, you, you you captured it really well. Thanks, thanks for that. The thinking that we had in in committee. I, I'm going to take a stab at at Don's first question on specific imaging procedures. Um, I, I, you know, CT comes to mind, Don, but I'm going to flip it around to the actual users. I, I think you know, if there's poster childs for who 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 benefits the most from IMR. I would say one comes to mind is in cancer care, it's the tumor boards. If you can imagine a whole bunch of, of, of different specialists sit around and, 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 and decide on a, a complex cancer case and they're drawing, drawing in CT images, path results, um, and, and a number of other things. Um, but if you had an IMR report that kind of you know takes them right to this, because the other thing is it's very work intensive to do a case for tumor boards. Uh, radiologists hate doing it because they have to pull all this stuff together. They have to collate the images, not only that, the present image, but also prior images. The other thing that we didn't get into is IMR. Uh, if we can embed, you know, if, if a radiologist needs to look at a prior image, all he has to do is click on the link and see the prior images. He doesn't have to go look for it uh, in the archive. So there's a lot of time savings on this. Um, I think one of the things that, that you asked about measurement and outcomes is I think Cree and Les have, have really done a good job in trying to show some metrics on what is the advantages of IMR. I think there's more to come. Um, I think, you know, there's work in place that wants to demonstrate the IMR actually facilitates a, a more streamlined radiology uh, workflow, and there could be some time savings. Uh, definitely more accuracy in terms of dictating um, the measurements. Uh, we all see and can conject that there's input errors. Uh, I think I think uh, Les hinted at that as as he took a step back in terms of dictating uh, imaging reports. Not only hinting, when I first got here and didn't have IMR, and it's not a matter of what I have here. I have great stuff here at Moffitt Cancer Center but I was making more mistakes than I'd ever done in my life. And it was because I had to actually say measurements and I hadn't done that in six years. So I went back in time in a way where, well, I was in the future, right? With, with NIH, that's just what NIH is. And, and with folks like Seth and yourself, uh, innovators can, can be doing this too. But uh, I was, uh, it, um, I still make mistakes on occasion by saying a measurement. I have to now look at them and I have to cross check six times with two diameters. So, it's a time savings for sure. Uh, even when we checked uh, one week and one month after we initially started IMR in 2015, by March, uh, the third week, uh, our dictations were, were, were quicker. 
it went uh, from a 14 minute uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis to 12 minutes on the average. So it's faster. Uh, we've also shown with human in the loop with automation uh, or people making measurements for us and in the hyperlinking, uh, it can reduce the time in half. Some people have uh, tripled their efficiency with, with human in the loop. And that's what we're going to see with AI. And I'll type out uh, a question here from uh, that Monif uh, sent with a link. I, I have a question for actually the other two panelists. So one of the things that th this is, I, I don't know if Elizabeth Krupinski measured this or, or I think earlier on uh, in, in, in the early days of, of, of PAX, one of the concerns that she brought was the amount of dwell time or eye time on images. And, and, and a factor in this is if you have to do that swivel chair and, and look at your measurements and then go over and look at the, the transcription window to make sure you, you, you got the right uh, numerals that you're dictating into the report, that's taking your eyes off the image. And I think dwell time is something we want to make um, increase rather than decrease. Can you make comment on that? No, I think that's a that's a great point. And you know, I think there's there's so much innovation going on right now in how we can automate the um, the curation of knowledge from our images, right? With all these you know decision support tools and and automatic measurements and contours. But at the same time, we're still relying on the radiologist to um, dictate those results and then turn those results back into text. So I, I think this innovation um, kind of, you know, we need to innovate in the reporting space um, while we're innovating in the kind of primary image diagnostic space. And yes, to your point, all of this goes to, you know, building the plumbing so that we're not relying on the human to be the the, the plumber or the carrier pigeon of taking data from one place to another. Um, while I stole the floor, I want to I want to address um, some of uh, Don's other questions because uh, you know thank you so much for your 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 comments. Um, I think one of the thing you know one of the the questions uh, that Don raised in the, in the chat is whether there are kind of legal issues. Um, regarding having hyperlinks to external systems. Um, and yeah, certainly radiologists and any image centric specialist is always concerned about the ramifications because a report is a, is a legal document. That being said, now that our images are always available, um, you know, I think radiologists are always being scrutinized um, if there is a discrepancy between a report and the imaging findings. And I think IMR just allows um, radiologists to be more explicit about what they're doing um, and what images were indeed used um, in, in their findings. Um, so I think ultimately, you know, obviously any, any, any change is different, but I think um, I, I don't think of this as a link to an external system. I really just think about it as kind of a natural reunion of the two data sources that um, are really describing the same thing. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that will be an issue. Um, you know, the other issue Don raised is, um, you know, how, how IMR will scale when shared across institutions. Um, and one of the things we tried to do is, is you can't, we can't boil the ocean. So yes, it would be amazing to be able to share an IMR between institutions and have those hyperlinks work, um, but the realities, um, as you as you raised in the in the chat, are that you know, right, there, you know not every institution has external access to their enterprise viewer. Um, certainly, you have authorization uh, issues where most external users are not going to be authorized to access the enterprise viewer from another institution. So our focus is on let's let's build the piping to get this work within an institution. And, you know, honestly, there are huge report sharing issues um, between, just for basic plain text reports right now. Um, and really, we, we can't solve everything. Uh, I just, so, yes, uh, I, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I wanted to mention that uh, Greg Cohen uh, mentioned that he's not seeing the questions. So I wasn't answering some of mine in full text, but Nikki sent something too. And I think a great way to answer, uh, there's pages of questions now, and I'd like to get to them all. You have record of these, Nikki, that we can, we I can do. answer them. 
Yeah. Correct. What I can do yeah. is I can export them after in the next 24 hours and send them on over to you all. And if you don't mind answering them, then we can post them on the SIM website. So just to follow up on what Seth said, that's one thing we actually did scope was we, we wanted to handle how EMR would be deployed with we wrote to this in in, in 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 the profile that was published last last summer. We did scope it to within an organization or enterprise, but we did recognize in some of the concept sections that um, it will be something that that needs to be developed, and it is challenging to go between enterprises. Uh, and again, security comes in in, in a big way, so uh, it's not something we'll tackle as 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 more systems come up. And when and people submit to us, you know, how, how do we how do we address this? So that's yeah. it's on our radar. It's just that, like like Seth said, you got to start somewhere. And you want to get the plumbing in place to make it work, in, at least within an organization. And um, you know, just addressing you know the, this issue as well as the other related issue, I think that Don brought up as far as you know, the, you know, a lot of providers just want to print or you know fax a report, right? How can you print or fax an IMR? The nice thing about using Fire is that um, one of the core principles in Fire is that every coded observation um, has a text, um, a textual description um, of that observation. And um, one of the important parts of the Fire Diagnostic Report is that there's a present uh, presented form. And so that either I, I believe it either needs to be a PDF or an HTML version of the report um, that could be easily easily rendered. Um, and easily printed or easily rendered in a, in a non-interactive fashion. So that kind of graceful scaling down um, so that we can preserve the, you know, the, the portability of the report is, is really critical in, in us thinking about this. Uh, I just saw another question here and, and there's a lot of them. It's, it's Tommy then, Tommy V. Uh, he's asking he, as a vendor, he he's investing in MR, but would like, he, he, and he feels he could prove the time savings. But how does he measure the improvement in error rate? Um, the only thing I can point you to is that that error, those error rates are actually well published out there today. Um, a lot of them will, will will have to deal with you know what is the error rate due to VR. Uh, so they're there uh, when it is it's a given acceptance of the fact that it happens. One is also the decimal point. That's another uh, source of error and, and it's out there. How do you prove it? Well, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Do you guys know of any studies that have, 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 have sought this? It's probably more in the quality realm than anything. Um, and a lot of times these errors are caught by the reader. Um, Seeing that no, this 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 can't be a hundred. It's got to be ten point zero, um, or something like that. That's just an example. Any thoughts on on that? Seth? Yeah, I mean, just first of all, thank thank you as a vendor for for working in this space and and bringing this um, to something that's going to you know change change practice at more institutions. And I, I don't have an answer, but I, I thank you for taking this focus because I think another reason that IMR hasn't been more broadly adopted is it's thought of something that the referring physicians love and want, but it's thought of something that takes extra time for the radiologists. Um, and that's absolutely not the case, right? As, as Les pointed out. So I think um, however you end up doing it, right? We do need to show that these tools are actually beneficial for the specialist creating the report. Um, reducing error and making work more efficient. Wonderful. All right. We are at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, gentlemen. This was amazing. Um, as mentioned, the resources and the link will be coming out in the coming days. So just keep an eye out on the SIM website. Um, <clears throat> wanted to just remind everybody of some upcoming activities, including next week's enterprise imaging webinar on multi-vendor image sharing solutions, as well as the SIM call for abstracts coming up in December. As a reminder, this webinar is eligible for one hour of CE, so um, please be sure to complete your survey at the end, and we'll make sure that gets posted in your SIM account. If you are a HIMSS member looking for CE, feel free to just reach out directly to me, and we'll make sure that you get that uh, certificate for you. And uh, last but not least, please, we value your feedback. 
take the survey at the close of this webinar and help us plan for future webinars. And once again, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. This was absolutely amazing. Um, and we look forward to the future of IMR uh, within imaging. So thank you again. Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.